This is the current federal tax developments for the week of December 19th, 2022. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by your State Society of CPAs and by Kaplan Financial Education. This, we're going to look at some of the things that happened in the area of federal taxes. And we'll start by looking at a rather long memorandum the IRS issued that related to a marketed program that's being uh, aimed at law firms that seeks to defer recognition of legal fees for 10 years, at least in the case they were discussing. So we'll talk about the IRS's view on that program. As you may suspect, it was not terribly positive, but also why and what the differences are and what the issues are. We're also going to talk about the fact that the IRS has apparently now finally given up on Congress going back and changing Section 174 to allow immediate expensing before the end of the year, as they have released the official automatic change of accounting method procedure that will allow taxpayers filing the returns for tax year 2022 to be able to make the change required by law to amortize their research and experimental expenditures over five years if performed in the U.S., over 15 years if performed outside the U.S. That change of method is required on the upcoming returns, and there are some special rules that are going to come into play along with that, and we'll talk a little bit about what's in that area. And finally, the IRS released a reminder this week that, in case it slipped your mind, the second half of the payment for deferred employer FICA and deferred self-employment tax, one half of that from 2020, that was a COVID-19 relief provision. That second payment is due coming up here shortly. And what I want to remind you is there are some nasty penalties if you don't get that paid on time. So with that, let's start with this memorandum from the IRS. This is Advanced Memorandum 2022-007. It came out on December the 16th. Now, as I say, this is a relatively long memorandum from the IRS. And it looks at a program that the memo says is being marketed to law firms that claims it can allow the law firm to delay, at least in the case it was raised in this particular memo, for 10 years, the recognition of legal fees. And they're basing this on a case that came from the 1990s, which is the case of Childs versus Commissioner, 103 TC number 36. That particular case involved a law firm that was getting a, you know, getting basically paid by the defendant's attorney their share of the law fee. They had a contingent fee. So the insurance company was paying their client. And then also they were paying the uh, law firm. And it was on a structured settlement setup. And basically the law firm was able to recognize that income, not at the time the lawsuit was completed, uh, when the IRS tried to argue they had to recognize it, but rather they were allowed to recognize that fee only as they received it. They were a cash basis taxpayer. Now, we're going to talk about why the IRS says, you know, child basically doesn't really work with the setup we have here. And one suspicion I have for why maybe it doesn't work is because child has been known about for a long time but amazingly, it appears just now somebody has, you know, decided to do this structure. And I think a lot of people, myself included, uh, see some of the same flaws the IRS sees with this structure and why it's not the same as the child's case. I also think the child's case, as we'll discuss a little bit more, is also a case of the facts in child. It worked to the taxpayers or to the law firm's favor because they had the good luck that the law that the insurer in question chose executive life as the company to pay off the annuity. If you don't recall the 1990s executive life, uh, they failed. I mean, it was a major insurance company failure. And this annuity was not going to be paid out in full. And so we got back to the insurer had to make up the difference. And that liability from the payer, I think, is crucial. And the fact it really had happened by the time that this case got in front of the court, I think had more than a slight influence on the ultimate decision of the court. Like it or not, judges do look at the situation. And, you know, while before executive life, you might have thought, oh, well, there's no chance whatsoever. That's perfectly secured. No problem. And suddenly like, well, it wasn't. So then all of a sudden it was, yeah, we, we got a decision, which 
might not have happened had executive life not have happened. But, you know, that's that's open. I'm sure theoretically uh, the court would claim, no, it would have been decided that way anyway. Well, we'll see. Executive life certainly made the decision easier to explain to parties who might have otherwise wondered about it. Now, in this particular case, we have a law firm who had negotiated a settlement agreement for a client in a physical injury case. Now, prior to actually signing the agreement, but basically after everything was done, all everything was done but the shouting and the final signatures, the law firm entered into an agreement with this third party who says, hey, we can make sure you guys don't need to pay taxes on this. I believe the actual fee was $450,000 was their share of the award. You'll need to pay tax on $450,000 this year. We, we can like defer it and we can not only defer it, but we can invest the funds for you and have those funds grow and eventually pay you out at the end. So you'll be able to have those funds. You'll have them invested and they'll grow. You can even borrow against those funds. And we'll talk about that too, which by the way, the law firm actually did in this case. In any event, they signed that agreement and they uh, basically, when the final payment came, the insurance company that was making the payment on behalf of the plaintiff, uh, you know, in essence, they had them divide the payout between the amount that would go to their client that went into the trust account for the law firm. And then the rest of it, the 450,000 that represented their share of the award, that would be their fees. They had that sent off to this third party. Now with this third party, they had an agreement with them that the, that they would be paid these fees after 10 years. So basically it would be 10 years from the time they signed the agreement. They signed it in 2021. So they would receive this payout in 2031, which would be the $450,000 plus investment earnings. And during that time, the law firm would be able to suggest, strongly suggest, uh, to this third party where those funds should be invested. And the third party would obviously take a you know, percentage of the funds off the, you know, off the top. Eventually, they'd charge a fee for doing this. But the argument was that this would allow them to magically be able to defer this uh, recognition of income for 10 years. Now, I think a key fact here that's mentioned briefly in the agreement, but the only reason why the client, the client would be willing to do this is because this being a physical injury case, Section 104A2 of the Internal Revenue Code meant the client was not going to pay tax on this award. And that's important because, in essence, these legal fees, you know, would be considered to be income to the client. And there could be a problem if we're going to say the pickup for income gets deferred, the payment could get deferred. And there could be problems if these would be above the line deductible legal fees, which, depending upon the fact pattern, is, I guess, still possible that, you know, the plaintiff, or I should say, yeah, you know, their client might not be so thrilled of having to pick it all up as income currently, but not being able to get the deduction until years later. Yeah, that might not have been fun. So anyway, I thought it was an interesting fact that we did have that case or just mentioned in, in passing. Now, as I said, this money went in, $450,000 went into this account on July 1st of 2021. And on August 1st of 21, the law firm borrowed $200,000 out of that account. So the third party gave them $200,000 loan. That was a loan with a stated interest rate. And the entire balance and the interest was due in five years. However, the note said, that if they didn't pay back the note, they had a right to just offset it against that payment and take it out of the funds being currently invested. So effectively, a month later, they had $200,000. And since it was an investment of the fund, and the fund apparently was going to just credit this interest to the taxpayer, in many ways, you know, it became just kind of a non-event. They had their $200,000 $200, today, and if they don't put it back in in five years with the interest, then all that's going to happen is, is they're just going to never have effectively invested the 200000 and they'll have the other two fifty that'll come out after the 10 years. Presumably, I would think in that case, they would pick up 200000 at the fifth year when there's the offset. But who knows? Maybe according to the way this, the firm views this or the third party viewed this, ah, we could go ahead and just wait till year 10 anyway. Not quite sure how that one would have worked. 
Now, here's a key issue. In the child's case, as I mentioned, the insurer in this case um, basically agreed to pay the fee over time in a structured settlement. Now, what the insurer did was they bought an annuity to pay it out over time. So they went to Executive Life. And actually, there, there were two insurance companies, one of which used Executive Life, the other one didn't. But let's talk about the one with Executive Life. So they went out and they, they bought this annuity to fulfill their obligations under this structured settlement payout. So fine, they got that in there. But the issue in this case was the insurance company, the, thir- the insurance company who was paying, so the party that was liable to pay was in full control of the annuity contract, owned it. The law firm had no right to reassign it or change it or anything of that sort. Okay, that would be the background in that case. Now, the other hitch was, since the insurer picked the, uh, picked the insurance company and was in charge of it and had the right to do whatever they wanted with that contract, they were just, uh, you know, they were just under obligation to get these payouts made on the appropriate dates in the future. They remain liable if the insurance company didn't perform, hint, executive life wouldn't totally perform, then they had to make up any differences, which obviously in this case they did. Because with executive life, uh, going under in the 90s, uh, in essence, they, they didn't get a full payout of the annuity contract equal to what they had been promised. So because of that, the insurance company had to make up the differential because all they were under, they were under obligation to pay X dollars to the attorney and I suppose in this case, their client over this time frame. In this case, the tax court said, look, that payout scheme you know, it's fully at, it's fully basically a deferred payout. And this deferred payout is fine because it's being paid over the time period that was agreed in the agreement. The uh, law firm never had, you know, control of this. All they had was the outfit that was going to pay. It said, we're going to pay over this time frame. Now, this payout was subject to the claims of the creditors, you know, at least potentially of that insurance company. You know, if they had, you know, if they'd failed, if they had issues, they went bankrupt, there is some risk of what you'll be paid out. So it is available to the claims of the creditors of the party that owes you the payment, right? And that turns out to be pretty significant, I think, in this case, why the tax court found that, okay, it was being delayed out. Now, the IRS attacks this marketed program that's shown up here in 2021, and we're sitting here in 22 now looking at. Uh, for various reasons. Let's talk about their attacks. The first attack they had was claiming that this represented an anticipatory assignment of income. And interestingly enough, one of the things they did, and I loved it in the memo, is if you remember, we had a case called Banks that went to the U.S. Supreme Court that decided whether if you had a lawsuit award, your contingent fee case, you have a lawsuit award. So the attorney is going to get one third of the award and you're awarded a million five. So the attorney is going to get 500,000. Now, the question became, was that 500,000, which was effectively assigned to the attorney, he had an absolute right in one third of your award. Was that really taxable to you as the plaintiff in the lawsuit or was it really taxable to the attorney only? Obviously, the attorney is going to pay tax on either way. So the question is, was it taxable to the attorney? And the key problem, obviously, is if you have a million five of income. And back in the old days, you know, back prior to TCJA, you might have gotten a deduction by 500000 but in many cases, it would have been a miscellaneous itemized deduction, which would have meant AMT would have absolutely wiped out any benefit. So you would have essentially paid tax on a million five, only having a million in your pocket. Obviously, that caused us some tax problems. Now, what the court said was, this is really similar to the bank situation in many ways. You're telling me you don't need to pay tax on it, at least not right now, because you don't get the money. And they're saying, no, just like in banks, in banks, the plaintiff, who's the person that has a right to a million five, but the damage of a million five, they, you know, elected in order to, you know, have the lawsuit go forward, they elected to say, attorney, we'll let you take one third of this, as long as you do the case, and you'll take one third of whatever you win. They said, well, this, they thought, was very similar. You know, just as the client had ownership of those entire rights to the proceeds, the law firm had the entire rights to the fee. 
and the fact that they assigned it to a third party was similar to the client assigning the legal fees, the, you know, the amount of the award necessary to pay legal fees to the third party who was their attorney in that case. So they said, first thing they think based on banks, this would be taxable to the law firm immediately, regardless of the fact it's going to go park for 10 years off in this other third party. And they said, second, the other key thing was that on a more general review of anticipatory assignment of income, the law firm during this entire claim effectively retained full control of the asset. The liability of the defendant slash insurer, actually it probably was whether it was a client, defendant, or insurer, we don't care which one, but the liability of that party was extinguished as soon as they transferred the funds to this third party selected by the law firm. The law firm had the full rights effectively to control investments. The law firm had the right to borrow funds out of this thing. In essence, the law firm had full control over the asset. And the mere fact that they chose to have that asset go to this third party does not mean somehow magically they don't have income just because they never touched the cash. They did a direct assignment over, but just as if I said, well, instead of that half million dollars, let's say lawsuit award, why don't you put that half million dollars into this closing for this building I'm buying? It's like, well, that's going to be a half million of income. That did, doesn't matter. You didn't touch the cash. And they would say it's the same thing here. But they also went back and argued that the economic benefit doctrine, a broader doctrine of the courts, also covered. They noted transfer of the assets to the law firm, right? They selected a third party to put the award beyond the reach of the creditors of the original payor. And they said, it's not clear the way the law would look at this. Is the payor here their client? Is the payor here the plaintiff in the lawsuit? Is the payor the insurance company that's going to actually pay on behalf of the plaintiff, not plaintiff for state, but defendant? Uh, in this case, you know, who is the client? But the court said it, it's really not, doesn't matter that much because the party that you're going to tell me, oh, it's at risk because their creditors could get a hold of this stuff. We might never see it is the third party who clearly was not the party under contract with the insurance company. I should say under contract with the attorney where the font, where the legal fee is going to be paid. The attorney did no services for this third party. This third party only got in the mix because the insurance company said, go take, go, go. To, okay. Client, my, this part of the award that is mine, we're just going to send it directly to this other company, right? That's how it worked. So because they have that, they said the economic benefit went to the insurance, went to the law firm who had control enough to control getting the asset over to the, to the other company. And so because of that, they said it's going to be taxable. And they also noticed that the child's case never did address the economic benefits doctrine. It wasn't raised in that case. They're saying, so regardless, even if you were like child's in the other ways, we're going to say the economic benefits doctrine in this case would cause it to be taxable. Finally, what the child's case was decided on, Section 83, they said, that's going to make it taxable here too. They said, what we have here is fundamentally a funded promise to pay by whoever the payor is. And again, the IRS concludes, it doesn't matter if you say the payor is the defendant, if the payor is the attorney's client, or if the payor is the insurance company that's paying off on behalf of the defendant, whichever one they are they're not the third party, right? So they basically took $450,000 and set that aside outside of, outside of their, outside of basically any claims of their creditors. They set it off to this third party and the creditors of any, any of those three could not attach that $450,000 of assets once the payment was made. And noted, since the service was performed for the client, the transfer portion award of the third party create a funded promise to pay. It was not subject to claims against the client or in the alternative, if you want to view the insurer, which they kind of did in, in the child's case as the party paying basically, or the, you know, basically the party who was like, like the client treated as a payor here, or even you want to take a look at the plaintiff in that realm. It doesn't matter. They didn't do any services for the third party operation. Therefore that meant this was a funded promise to pay, unlike Childs, where it was an unfunded promise. All we had was the insurance company saying, hey, we're going to make sure these payments come to you at this day. But they did not. Yes, they may have bought this uh, annuity, but it was put into a rabbi trust, as I understand remember the whole issue in that case, 
effectively like a rabbi trust. And essentially, you know, the uh, the law, or I should say, you know, the law firm in the child's case had no control. They were just waiting for the payout. And in fact, the insurance company chose to try to, you know, reduce their risk uh, by buying this policy from the wrong company, as it turned out, uh, was, you know, was just, hey, it's what they did. It was their choice. It was not the law firm's. And finally, this I thought was a unique attack. They said, okay, let's assume somehow that you convince a court that this is a deferred compensation arrangement, unfunded deferred compensation arrangement. They said, well, here's a neat thing. Back in the early 90s, 409 Cap A did not exist. And 409 Cap A imposes some very strict rules on non-qualified deferred compensation arrangements between a service provider and the service recipient, okay, or various parties. If you have non-funded, you have unfunded deferred comp, there's going to be an issue. And as they point out, if 409 cap A applies, this is going to be a far worse result for the taxpayer. In essence, kind of a be careful what you wish for result for the taxpayer in this case. The third part, now you might say, wait, wait, but I remember 409 Cap A, it applies to employees, but these guys were contractors. It's like, you know, we're, we're a CPA firm. We're doing work for a client, right? You know, if the client doesn't pay us for two years, we're cash basis uh, for whatever reason. And we even agree to that. You can pay us in two years. I mean, we're just going to pick it up two years from now, right? Yeah. Okay, good. And 409 Cap A is not a problem. Okay. Uh, but here's the catch, because there is an exception in the regulations called the third party contractor rule. But here's the catch. That rule only applies uh, to a plan, a deferred compensation plan between, in the view of the IRS, they said, or they, well, actually in the actual reg, it says this, a plan that is between the service recipient and the service provider. The IRS says, wait, this case, now, th th that's not what we have here. Because in this case, you have a contract between a third party who received no services from you and you, the service provider. As such, if it is a deferred compensation arrangement based on those services, well, tough luck. Uh, you know, it's like it's covered by 409 Cap A. And if it's covered by 409 Cap A and you violate Cap A, first thing is the entire balance is immediately taxable. The extent had already been taxable. So come into income immediately. And number two, there'll be a 20% additional penalty imposed on that amount you receive. That makes you much worse off, right? So we're going to take a look at that. And they're saying that's what would happen here. They say because this arrangement, once it's covered by 409 Cap A, violates two different rules. Uh, first, it fails what's called the initial election timing requirement. The election has to be made before services are performed. Okay, You can't apply this to services that have already been performed. And they said, look, this wasn't signed until just the instant before we're going to sign off on the settlement agreement. The services had effectively all been completed before this document, even they began thinking about it. And that means that you couldn't make a deferred compensation election for those prior services. That would violate 409 Cap A. It can't cover that. Number two, it said, even if that wasn't a problem, there are the anti-acceleration rules that do not permit you to take a substituted payment. Under the terms of the agreement, you had to have a date certain in the future when the payment be made. That would be a payout to come in 10 years. And that's what you originally said the deferral would be. But they said, but you're right to borrow against this. And then just say, instead of repaying the loan, say, ah, oh, forget about it. Just, just charge it against my account. That's a substituted payment arrangement. And as such, that's going to trigger 409 cap A. So their bottom line, the IRS says this thing doesn't work. Now, my gut is they're probably right it doesn't work. I, I do think the key problem here is that the law firm had control of the fee and they just assigned it to a random third party who had nothing to do with the case. I think if the situation was like Childs, where it was the you know client or the insurance company 
agreeing to handle the payout and have full liability during the term, well, you know, that, that would probably be a different, a different kettle of fish. But that's not what we have. We don't have the child's case here. We have the law firm taking $480,000 in cash they could have walked off with. There's no question they could. And simply assigning that to a third party. And like I say, very much that became just like when you take a hundred, when you basically get that $500,000 and say, well, don't give me the cash, but put it into that building, put it into that closing for the building I'm buying. Same difference. So yes, I do think it's highly unlikely this works. Number two, obviously uh, the IRS, you know, is publishing this and has this nice long memo because apparently they're likely to start challenging these arrangements anyway. So if you do have a law firm who probably isn't a tax law firm, because usually tax law firms, you know, they're going to do something like this. They do it on their own with their own research and stuff. They're not going to be buying it off the shelf. So it's probably going to be a law firm that doesn't do taxes. Uh, you know, you might say, yeah, you really should go get legal counsel of your own and have them look over this and see whether any of this makes sense. And if it doesn't, then don't worry about it. But bottom line, you need to realize that the service has essentially said they're going to challenge you on this. So be aware of that. Finally, I want to remind you of one thing here. Well, no, we got this. I remember we have here the research and experimental research and experimental expenditures accounting method change procedure. Forgot we have two more things to talk about. This is Revenue Procedure 2023-8 issued on the 12th of December. Now, if you remember right, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had a few bad news things, but when you got the law, uh, those bad news things generally are going to happen like years down the line. Don't worry about them. One of those things was going to be under Section 174. 174A allows a business to immediately expense research and experimental expenditures, and it always had since 1954. However, to make their budget numbers work, and I think it was Senator Corker, that was their problem they were having, who was at a very hard line on exact cost. Was it $2.1 trillion? Whatever it was. But it had to meet that score. So to meet that score, they designed this provision that require amortization of R&D over five years with a mid-year convention for U.S., 15 years of mid-year convention for non-U.S. Now, what that means is your client's research expenditures that last year they could deduct 100% of, this year they're going to have to do it, quote, five year with half your convention means they're going to be on a straight line basis. That's going to be only one-tenth of those expenses. So if they, let's say, last year had $500,000 of research and experimental expenditures because they do that in developing products and the other things that Reg 1.174-2 talks about as items that might be in these categories. If they had, let's say, you know, 500000 of that last year, we would only get to deduct 50000 this year and 450000 would have to go forward into future years for recovery, which means that's probably $450,000 more of taxable income, not cheap. So again, we required this beginning this year. Now, of course, the theory was at the time that this would never become law. When Congress does stuff like this, it's bad news and it's five years down the line. Reality is it's probably never becoming law. You may remember the Cadillac tax from the Affordable Care Act, which was a very similar provision that was enacted. It made the, it made the budget numbers work. So everybody there said, see, we're only spending this much money, right? See, we're only costing us this much money, TCJ. But in reality, we all knew that it wasn't ever going to really become law. Except there's now a problem. We've gotten to the due date, and for various reasons, including the failure of the uh, Build Back Better Act last year, which had a huge cost, and this thing was kind of buried in there to fix it, and then followed up by the Inflation Reduction Act this year, which had to come in, not only have, not, wasn't just it wouldn't spend money, wouldn't spend extra money, it had to come and actually reduce the deficit long term. So there was no way to make that one work, you know, and still get Senator Manchin's vote uh, without, you know, take, keeping this out. We couldn't fix it. And now the problem is with everybody talking about inflation and worried about, you know, things stoking inflation. Uh, nobody wants to be seen voting for a bill that's going to be scored to increase the deficit. Now, generally, nobody likes this provision. But if you're a Democrat, you're not as concerned about not liking this provision. Why? Mainly because you didn't vote for it. Remember, this was passed on a party line vote back in 2017. 
That's why I think we're not hearing a lot of complaints about this, except, I mean, you read them in tax circles and you read them in this area, but you don't see people going on TV and talking about this. And the main reason is because, you know, in essence, the ones you would expect to complain about it more traditionally would have been on the Republican side. It's a tax increase, right? Terrible, horrible thing we'd have. But the problem is most of the people who would go on TV to complain about this voted for it. And that would be pointed out. We've got this because you voted for it. You know, and it was your vote. Okay, here's here, here's the roll call vote on TCJ. Your vote, yes. You So you voted to do this. Why didn't you get this out of there? You know, and so there'd be a lot of finger pointing. It'd be kind of bad. And so the Democrats are effectively saying, well, if you want this, it's your mess. You need to give us something we want. And therein it becomes a major problem because what the Democrats want is an extension of the refundable child tax credit. And there are a couple of things Republicans would like to have, too, in a year-end bill. When you score all, all of them together, it's about a $700 billion cost over 10 years, which, again, nobody wants to be seen voting to spend $700 billion, increasing the deficits and going, you know, adding to inflation. So unfortunately, this thing that was never intended to become law has a decent chance of becoming law at least for a while. I still think it's a reasonable chance at some point in time when the heat's off and they feel they can push this through and the cost will not cost, will not be one that will come back to haunt them as to you voted for this and inflation soared. It was horrible. It's terrible. All those things. So, you know, if we do get inflation under control, who knows? I've given up on trying to figure out what's going to happen anyway. But inflation was to come down. I wouldn't be surprised to see if and when that happens, that suddenly this is retroactively fixed. But for now, we got to be ready to make that change. Now, under this revenue procedure, very nicely, the permission is granted automatically if the change is made in the first year it's required, the first year beginning in 2022, as long as you, you, know, you just attach a statement to the return and the statement details are in the article we have for this week, but you attach a statement to the return with specified details from the revenue procedure. You don't need to have form 30, you don't need to have form 3115. And you don't need to, uh, you know, nothing else there. It'll be a cutoff method because it's only for things you paid for that were expenses incurred on or after, you know, basically on or after the first day of the first tax year beginning after December 31st, 2021. So we're just going to do it on a cutoff basis. Now, if you don't do it this year, you get or you get a client who didn't do it, then next year you will need to follow Form 3115 and you'll do a modified 41A adjustment, only going back to capitalize our re- research experimental expenditures that were incurred on or after Janu- on or after the first day of the first tax year beginning after January, or beginning on or after January 1st of 22. That would be your structure in that area. That's how we'd end up getting this. That's how this whole thing done. Now, the thing to remember and why you might want to extend these returns is unfortunately we could be redoing the whole thing if Congress does retroactively change this. You want to keep your eyes on what's happening, even if they don't solve the problem this week. And it'll probably be this week if anything was going to, if a tax provision is going to get stuck on here, it'll suddenly appear very rapidly next to the uh, spending bill they're going to supposedly work on this week, trying to get out of here uh, for their Christmas break, right? You know, they want to do the Christmas recess and they ain't missing that. So because of that, you know, we may see something, but if that doesn't happen this week and they let it go into the next Congress, you got to keep your eye on the next Congress, see what's going to happen. And it's a little complicated with next Congress right now, because due to the uncertainty in the House about who will be speaker, they've stopped actually working on appointing chairs of committees. And apparently there's a nice long line of people that want to be chair of ways and means and chair of ways and means would have a huge impact on what happens here. And unfortunately, that probably means the House won't get started doing things for a while. So we could have a very late retroactive fix. Certainly, probably, certainly it's not going to be in the first week of the new Congress. Uh, I would say probably sometime post regular tax season, uh, if not perhaps even toward the end of next year, depending upon how messed up things get in getting the Ways and Means Committee organized so they could actually do it. Yes, Senate Finance could take the lead. Technically, though, revenue bills are supposed to start in the House, so they'd be playing with some stuff. So, yeah, maybe Senate Finance figures out what to do and waits to find a bill to attach it to. 
as possible, but it still seems unlikely the new Congress would fix things on this right away. Finally, the IRS sent a reminder. They're going to remind you this week. This is a news release, IR 2022-220, issued on December 14th. This could entitled IRS Reminders for Many Employers and Self-Employed People Deferred Social Security Tax Payment Due December 31st. Now, if you remember back in 2020, we had an option for effectively just over three quarters of the year for employers to elect not to have paid the employer FICA and instead have paid, have waited and paid half of it at December 31st of 21 and half of it at December 31st of 22. So they got an interest-free loan through that period. Now, here's the catch. We are certainly approaching that second payment due date. That payment is due by December 31st of 2022. So it's important to remind your clients about the ways to do it. And this news relief tells you all the various ways you could try to make this payment. Uh, You know, EFTPS is most likely the way you're going to do it. But if you're a self-employed person, you're looking at the SE tax, you can make the payments via uh, IRS direct pay. You can use the credit card option on their website. Uh, They do indicate that you could do it via paying with a check or money order, but they send you back to the 941 instructions, which really, really, really say you can't do it. Uh, And But ways that you could try to do it and probably get penalized if you do. But in any event, it is due by the 31st. And the important thing to remember is something we discussed last August, or I should say August of 21. And the big thing that happened in August of 21 was that we discovered in August of 21 that the IRS said, if you are a day late or you're a dollar short in the amount you should pay, then you have failed to meet the requirements to use the deferral. Having failed, we go back to 2020 and we compute your late payment penalties and apparently interest based on the fact you should have paid these as early as March of 2020, and yet you didn't get around to paying them until January 3rd of 2022. Well, that's late. And you didn't pay. And the other problem is it won't just be this one payment, the second half. It's going to be that first payment you made timely last year because neither one would qualify for deferral unless you get it right for both. So you want to make very sure that your clients actually are getting these payments in. If you got anybody who did this, get a hold of them now. We still got a little time. It's, you know, basically where this is the week of the 19th, but not long. People disappear. Holidays are coming. So make sure you get a hold of them and make sure this payment is done before the end of the year and make sure it is the proper amount. Because again, either one of those penalties could be high. That was a, if you go back to our article there, which we discussed in the materials, uh, you know, that, that was basically, uh, as I recall, program manager technical advice was what was issued in August of 2021 that gave us this news. Well, this has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of uh, December 19th, 2022. As always, this is brought to you by Capital Financial Education and your state society CPAs. As you know, you, if you have any questions, you can email me at zollers at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, I also do follow discussions on some state society websites. The Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Illinois, uh, Washington, Minnesota, I follow there. I also follow discussions on Idaho's discussion, kind of quasi-related discussion board. They don't use the Connect software that other societies are using, but they use their own uh, different structure. So I'm on there as well. You also can uh, find me to some extent, you know, you can watch around and see, you know, where I show up for other discussions. Uh, things like that. I'm going to be, I'm looking a little bit on Reddit, shall we say, for there, back again to our tax pros to see some looks in there and take a look other places. Uh, we are coming up on the holiday season. Not sure how much is going to happen this week in taxes. I'm right now still planning to get something out probably on Tuesday the 27th. It would be the most likely day, right? I think that's, yeah, it would be the 27th Tuesday. Uh, since the 25th is Christmas, 26th, therefore, be the day off, 27th is the day you'd start. So we'd look at that, see if we have anything big, I'll get it there. There's a possibility that things will, you know, timing won't work out. We'll just have to be uh, going later because not much happens into the year. We'll discuss it. Obviously, if we do get a new tax bill, 
And I think there's at least a reasonable chance we'll get the follow-up to the SECURE Act. We'll obviously be talking about that as that comes in. So that, that's something to watch for too. But otherwise, uh, just tune in. Hopefully we'll be back here next week with something to discuss. Maybe a new tax bill. Maybe not or whatever else may happen in the area of current federal tax developments.